Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we start with our today's analysis, a quick gentle reminder. As part of Target Prelims 2022, our tomorrow's session would be in reference to garment schemes. Please do tune in from 7.30 to 9.30 pm and this session will be handled by Harshmeet Singh sir. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says, turning down the volume on call to prayer. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. The article here is speaking about use of loudspeakers at religious places. The Uttar Pradesh government recently enforced a strict crackdown on the illegal use of loudspeakers in religious places. Why was there a strict crackdown? That is because there were number of religious places. They were not given permission by the state authorities or the local authorities for the use of loudspeakers. They had violated the laws of the state. Added to it, even if permission was granted by the local authorities and the state authorities, there is a prescribed benchmark beyond which they are not supposed to have a noise. So there is a benchmark, even if the loudspeakers are used, it has to be below this threshold. But in number of places in Uttar Pradesh where loudspeakers were used, it was beyond this threshold. So what was the major problem? There were two problems. One, there were certain religious places where permission was not given to but they continued to use the loudspeakers and the other happened to be even if permission is given it was beyond a particular threshold and as a result it became a source of noise pollution. So in this particular article the author goes on to say that this use of Uttar Pradesh government to effectively bring an end to it is the right decision and at the same time, what we will also look at is multiple other judgments given by different high courts and the same by the Supreme Court. Let us try and understand this article in greater detail. Back in the 1960s and 70s, what exactly happened? There were use of loudspeakers in the 1960s and 1970s by different religious outfits. These religious outfits wanted to call people for the prayers. So they were in that particular time period using the loudspeakers. To a minimal extent, you can also say that they had their right. Why? Because back in the 1960s and 70s, you did not have the mobile communication. You were not able to set alarms as well. You did not have the advanced alarm systems as well. So people would not be able to know when they have to get up, when they have to follow their religious practices as well as the prayers. So to a minimal extent, it is acceptable that during the 1960s and during the 1970s, it is okay to call people to the prayers via the loudspeaker. But now what is happening? We are in the era of internet, mobiles and applications. So phones are there and loudspeakers are no longer necessary. So this article currently goes on to say from the historical picture maybe it is right but in the current situation where people have the alarms where people have advanced mobile systems why do you have to use these loudspeakers and call the people if they wish to come for the prayers for the morning prayers or any time of the day they can come on their own setting the alarms is the first argument made by the author. Added to it, when you look at the 1970s and post 1990s, what exactly happened? Multiple religious outfits were present in a particular area. Let's assume there are a number of uh, religious places that are present in a particular area. They started competing with each other. Competition for what? Competition one for not something good, but for use of the loudspeakers. So they were competing. So multiple loudspeakers pointing at different directions for the sound to travel all across came into play as well. This in itself became a major source of noise pollution because of these religious outfits competing against each other. Who will be more louder? This also created a lot of nuisance to the people. Why nuisance? That is because each of these people had loudspeakers across all areas and this ultimately meant that for people who were sleeping, for people who were ill, for people who were disturbed and tired, if they were sleeping, taking their nap, these loudspeakers disturb their sleep. What do we understand from this? That there was a prescribed benchmark. This benchmark was not followed. The threshold set by the authorities were not followed and they were played at odd times as well. This ultimately meant it became a source of noise pollution and this had to be regulated. This is where we have to understand what is the source of noise? What do we understand by noise with respect to the Indian laws? Noise has been defined as an 
unwanted sound or potential health and communication hazard dumped into the environment with regard to the adverse effect it may have on the unwilling ears so people did not want to hear it but in some cases because these loud speakers came from the religious places they had to accept it and face the fury of it further if you look into noise pollution where is it mentioned it is mentioned under air prevention and control of pollution act of 1981 section 2 of a says a uh, air pollute is any solid liquid or gaseous substances including noise present in the atmosphere in such concentrations as to be or tend to be harmful to the humans other living creatures plants property or the environment further rule 5 of the noise pollution regulation and control rules 2000 under the environment protection act of 1986 reach restriction on the use of loud speakers and public address system it further says a loud speaker or a public address system shall not be used except after obtaining written permission from the authority now we understand that they have to get the permission but number of religious outfits and places did not get the permission itself and at the same time the schedule to the noise pollution rules specifies the different limits for ambient noise in different areas what do we mean by it there is a prescribed threshold this particular place if there is noise pollution beyond this particular threshold it will be called as noise pollution and the authorities can be immediately contacted and they can ask these industries or the commercial areas to reduce the noise in this particular area for the industrial areas it is about 75 decibels in the day 70 decibels at night time in the commercial areas it is 65 decibels in the day 55 decibels at night time residential areas it is 55 decibels in the day 45 decibels at night time and silent zones have 50 decibels in the day 40 decibels at night time so what we understand is that there is a prescribed standard established by the authority if there is illegal use of the loud speakers or even if they are using the loud speakers beyond this established Established threshold in that particular case, they are violating the laws of the country, laws of the land, and ultimately they needs to be checked. Which is why we have the Uttar Pradesh government, which also took the judgment from the Motilal Yadav versus the state of Uttar Pradesh, which was about. controlling the menace that was emanating from the loudspeakers so what did the uttar pradesh government do the uttar pradesh government took one of the judgments from the allahabad high court this judgment had clearly said that if there are religious outfits not taking the permission from the authorities are violating the laws of the land because they have not got the permission in that case strict crackdown can be enforced on these religious places which is why we have the uttar pradesh government take up this particular initiative and they were irrespective of all religions religions did not matter but any religion outfit if they were using these loud speakers against the laws such were immediately restricted however the response from the people was also good as well the government action was met with considerable mature response and at the same time there were no threats that were issued to the government they did not say that they will hit the road or go to the supreme court of india or there were no calls for rallies behind it since this was in line with the law since this was a call of the high court since this was the government legitimate interest because it wanted to safeguard the health of the people everything was set into priority according to the government of uttar pradesh now let's look at multiple other judgments given by different high courts in india when we look into 2016 we had the bombay high court which ruled that use of loud speaker was not a fundamental right what did the bombay high court say the bombay high court said and it observed that no religion or sect could claim that right to use a loud speaker or a public address system was a fundamental right and this fundamental right cannot be guaranteed under article 25 of the constitution of india why because if there is any violation of this established principle it means that they are violating the noise pollution rules and if this particular religion or religious outfit is violating the noise pollution rules that is not 
going to serve the purpose for the common people and ultimately it also violates the fundamental rules guaranteed under article 21 which is about right to life and right to health is an aspect of article 21 and right to sleep is an aspect of right to health that is getting violated so in 2016 the bombay high court ruled that use of loudspeaker was not a fundamental right in 2018 the uttarakhand high court directed the state government to ensure that no loudspeaker or public address system is used by any person or organization including religious bodies without the written permission of the relevant authorities so even if they had to use these loudspeakers at a prescribed time what they required was the permission the loudspeakers kept on playing even up till 12 midnight as well the loudspeakers cannot be permitted to be so and even if they are using written permission will have to be taken from the authorities if no permission is granted they should not be using it said the Uttarakhand High Court in 2019 the Punjab and Haryana High Court banned the use of loudspeakers at public places including the religious bodies the court said that public address system could only be used with the prior permission and noise level should not exceed the threshold or the permissible limit established by the state. These are the different landmark judgments given by different high courts in our country. Added to it, we also have to look at what Supreme Court of India has said. Back in the year 2000, during the case of Church of God in India versus KKR Majestic Colony Welfare Association, the Supreme Court held that the court may issue directions in respect of controlling noise pollution even if such noise was a direct result and off was connected with the religious activities so it went on to say if there is noise that is emanating even if it is from the religious practices the supreme court in the larger interest of the public they would be able to control it said the supreme court of india why that is because there might be religious practices yes we accept it but there are also larger societal interest as well let's say in a civilized society there are people who would be sleeping they would be disturbed, there would be children, there would be old people, there would be senior citizens, there would be other disabled people, they would be sleeping. And if these loudspeakers are played in the early hours of the time, in that case, their sleep might be disturbed. So we cannot entertain it, said Supreme Court back in the year 2000. The Supreme Court in 2005 had also banned the use of loudspeakers and music systems in public places between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. except in cases of public emergency back in July 2005. So in case of public emergency, you would be able to use the loudspeakers. But if not, they can only be used between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m and it also gave permission to the states as well where they would be allowed to use the loudspeakers until midnight in some of the festive occasions for 15 days in a year. This is not the normal but in exceptional circumstances the state is given the power where they can give permission to the festive occasions only and this should be restricted only for about 15 days. Further the Supreme Court in number of other landmark judgments has also said sleep is essential for a human being to maintain the delicate balance of health necessary for its very existence and survival. Sleep is therefore a fundamental requirement without which existence of life would be in peril to disturb sleep therefore would amount to torture which is now accepted as a violation of human right so it indirectly said that there is right to health right to health is an aspect of right to life and if right to life is disturbed in that particular case you can have the state step up immediately and stop all the noises that are emanating from the loudspeaker irrespective of where it is from whether it is religious or non-religious and if it is to do with religious, then the state has the power to regulate it, said the Supreme Court of India. So what are we looking at? We are looking at loudspeakers. We are looking at loudspeakers from the religious places. And if they have not got the permission, if they are violating the threshold and permissible limit, in that case, the state has every right to regulate, restrict. And in that case, it can also oppose and restrict them as well. It is this that we have to understand in reference to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article says India's judiciary and the slackening cog of trust. This article here is speaking about corruption in the Indian judiciary. When we speak about different organs of the state, we have the legislature, 
we have the executive and we also have the judiciary we always rely on the legislature to make some good laws we always rely on the executive to ensure that there is proper implementation of these laws but there are instances where the legislature and the executive may come together they may not work in the interests of the people so it is us who always rely on the judiciary so the judiciary is the last ray of hope for the people in the country but what if the judiciary itself becomes corrupt what if the judiciary which has to be independent impartial fair and should always promote equitable equality if it is promoting partiality or it has a close nexus with the political system or the judiciary in itself is involved in bribery and corruption so this article here is speaking about two such instances where the author goes on to say that judicial corruption can basically take two forms what are these two forms one political interference in the judicial process by the legislative or the executive branch and the second is the direct involvement of the judiciary in terms of accepting the bribery first let us take into picture what is politics got to do with judiciary let's say for example there is a particular case this particular case what happens the state is a party to this particular case then you also have the private individual as well so against the state you have all required evidence you have the arguments that is made by the petitioner side you have every other evidence and documents which is against the state in spite of it what you have is judiciary making a judgment towards the state and this is a grave injustice to the private citizens so basically in the the first instance what is happening there is direct nexus between the judiciary and the political system that is the executive and in this case when all the arguments and evidence and documents literally everything even though it is against the state but still the judgment is made in favor of the state and this hurts the private individual so the first case is where there is a nexus and this means there is a corruption involved indirectly is the first major argument the second major argument is in reference to the bribery so we will have many other instances we will take them up eventually what you also have to understand is the larger picture of the judiciary so when you look at the larger picture of the judiciary what exactly happens we have something called as the substantive justice then we have something called as the procedural justice what is this substantive justice and procedural justice let me simplify this for you with the help of certain examples we have something called as the substantive law then we also have something called as the procedural law what is the substantive law let me give you an example let's say we have the transfer of property act of 1882 we have the contract act of 1872 or let's say for example we have the indian penal code these are the laws which are called as substantive laws then we have some of the procedural laws what are these procedural laws we have the code of the civil procedure we have the criminal procedure code we have the evidence act as well these are some of the procedural laws if there are laws that give substantive rights to the people that is what is called a substantive law well, let me explain this let's say for example there is a person who has entered a contract this person has entered the contract but is violated the contract so in this particular case what damages have to be paid what compensation have to be paid is given in the indian contract act so the laws that are emanating from the indian contract act and justice delivered through the substantial law is called a substantial justice let me give you another example let's say for example you have a rent agreement with one of your tenants or you have a lease agreement with one of your tenants so the tenant has to pay you a monthly prescribed rent or lease amount of let's say for about three years in this case if this person is not paying you the rent or the lease amount in that case he's violated certain rules and regulations so what you have you have the transfer of property act the transfer of property act says that if this particular person has violated certain rules and regulations you have every right to seek the damages and compensation so this law and this justice that is provided to the substantive law that you have is what is called a substantive justice 
justice then you have procedural justice let me give you an example let's say for example you have the indian penal code the indian penal code says that if a murder is committed what would happen that particular person whoever is the accused if it is proved in the court of law this person can be put behind bars for let's say hypothetically 10 years or 20 years so this is what the indian penal code says with respect to the substantive law but how should this person be arrested how should this person be investigated where should be he be taken is provided in the procedural law let's say for example if there is a particular person who is arrested today he has to be put before the court of law within 24 hours but if this is violated it means the procedural law is violated if that is violated then procedural justice will be violated so what we have is substantive law where your rights is guaranteed but there are procedures to be followed for the substantive law to be implemented so the procedural justice if it is violated once again that is the violation of the law so what is the author trying to say the author in this particular case goes on to say that there have been ample number of examples in the Indian judiciary where substantive justice is violated procedural justice is violated so he takes the example of the Citizenship Amendment Act. So the author in this particular case makes an argument that the Citizenship Amendment Act were in violation of some of the secular principles and as a result it was a violation of substantive justice. But before what the author says let me also give you another parameter to it. In law, we have something called as interpretation of statutes. In interpretation of statutes, you would have one of the topics called as presumption. So every law that is passed by the legislature, it can be at the state level or it can be at the central level, is presumed to be valid and constitutional. So until and unless it is declared by the court of law, either the high court or the supreme court, that it is unconstitutional, every law is assumed to be valid. Why is it assumed to be valid? It? that is because when you look at the presumptions it clearly goes on to say that when you consider the legislature the legislature is a rational body they always have the principle of justice which is why they are elected by the people so ultimately they are accountable to the people so every law that they devise is held valid it is held constitutional that is because people have elected them if there are any issues go to the court of law prove it in the court of law and only when the court of law either the high court or the judiciary says it is invalid or unconstitutional that is when a particular law will be called as unconstitutional so with respect to the caa as of now it is a constitutional law until it is said unconstitutional by the supreme court but according to the author he says that caa is unconstitutional is not in line with the secular principles it's a viewpoint of the author but a larger picture is that you have to know that all laws are valid until it is declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court or by the High Court. The second principle is in reference to the procedural law. The author goes on to speak about, about one of the cases, that is he takes the example of Lal Bihari. Lal Bihari happens to be one of the person. He was officially declared dead in 1975. He was alive, but he was declared dead in 1975. He had to fight for a long number of years and finally he had to prove and ultimately the court says, yes, he is alive in in 1994 so this was a war that he had to take upon himself to prove to the court of law and to the society that he is alive for almost two decades so this is where there is procedural injustice says the author so the author in this particular case says that there have been instances where there is substantial injustice as well as procedural injustice that have been dealt by the judiciary and unfortunately people have become the major sufferers added to it there are some outdated dysfunctional laws or the statutes that are still present in the system this is not deleted from the system and there are laws because of which there are undue delay there is corruption all of this will have to be taken care by the legislature and also by the judiciary now if you look into some of the statistics as given by this article what the second point that we did discuss was in reference to what is called as bribery so the article here goes on to say according to transparency international 45 percent of the people who had come in contact with the judiciary between 2009 and 2010 had paid a bribe to the judiciary there were fixed rates for a quick divorce based 
bail and other procedures, the Asian Human Rights Commission estimates for every two in the official court fees at least thousand was to be spent in bribes in bringing a petition to the court. So judiciary was our last hope, but judiciary itself is involving itself in the corruption, and that becomes the major problem. Added to it, freedom house freedom in the World 2016 report for India states that the lower levels of judiciary in particular have been rife with corruption. The GAN Business Anti-Corruption Portal reports that there is high risk of corruption when dealing with India's judiciary, especially at lower court levels. Bribes and irregular payments are often exchanged in return for favorable court decisions. Further, allegations of corruption against high court judges abound. For example, in the Thies Hazari District Court, senior civil judge was arrested in 2016 for allegedly accepting a bribe rule in favor of a complainant in this particular case. So the data clearly goes on to show that there have been ample number of examples where bribery is also persisting in the judiciary. So the last hope, the last ray of light for most of us who'd want to go to the judiciary is also getting corrupted. So the author in this particular says goes on to say that this would be a blatant violation of some of the democratic values. There is a clear nexus between the judiciary and the police. They've also colluded as well. So what we have to do, this will be an abject failure of the governance if it is not remodeled. So this whole trust in the judiciary will fail so it is the right time for everyone to awaken and make sure that there is no corruption in the lower judiciary or there are some issues in the system these will have to be addressed says the author it is this that we have to understand in reference to this article now let's look into the next article this article says the multiple crisis in Indian universities. The article here is speaking about number of issues in the Indian universities. The author brings into picture what are the issues and concerns with respect to the higher education system in India. The author points out some of the important statistics. What are those? Spending on higher education in India has stagnated at 1.3 to 1.5 percent since the year 2012. So since the year 2012, we are in now 2022 it's been the decade and in spite of this there is not much improvement in the higher education spending is the major concern the ministry of education is pushing higher education institutions to increase their incapacity by about 25 percent we are not making any investments in the education sector but in spite of it we are forcing some of the colleges to add more number of seats but then we are not even recruiting the teachers and the professors as well the ministry of finance has also set to ban the creation of new teaching posts and at the central level student financial aid was cut in the financial year 2020-23 and the allocations for the research innovations were down by 8%. So this article goes on to say that we are facing multiple issues on the higher education front and this is because the government is not making enough of budget allocation to the education sector in the country. So the author goes on to say as a result of which the higher education sector is bound to suffer. The author also substantiates this with the help of number of examples. What does the author say? The author initially goes on to say that the investments in the university infrastructure have shrunk. When we speak about the university city infrastructure. What do we require? What we require is classrooms. These classrooms will have to meet the modern technology. What we require is the ventilation and unfortunately in number of higher educational institutions there are poor ventilations as well. What we require is sanitation. That is what we speak about when it comes to the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. But unfortunately the sanitation services are not good in the colleges and when we speak about hostels we have seen in multiple movies as well that the hostel food is not good the accommodation is not good basic facilities may not be provided in that case what is the higher education institution and its authorities are doing so the first major problem is investments in university infrastructure have shrunk and as a result of which there are crowded classrooms poor ventilation sanitation facilities are not meeting the internet standards and unfortunately there is unsatisfactory hostel accommodation as well this has also impacted day-to-day running cost of multiple universities as well. Let's take for example, if there is enough amount of budget allocation made to the university, they would be able to develop multiple areas. Now because they do 
not have the enough amount of investment this has hit multiple areas one they have to pay salaries they have to pay salaries to the people to the office boys to the people who are helping them and also to the professors because they do not have enough amount of investment or enough amount of allocation is not made there are teachers and professors and other associated staff as well as the su supporting staff who are not paid salaries and even if it is paid salary there is a delay as well so the first major problem that we have is that there is not enough money that is being contributed to the universities and as a result of which there is a delay when it comes to the salaries added to it when we speak about the colleges every colleges will also have a database they will also have fixed number of journals as well let's say for example if it is uh, an engineering college they might subscribe to IEEE papers or let's say for example if it is arts or commerce similarly they would have their own set of databases and subscriptions that they have on a yearly basis if colleges are not provided with enough amount of money in all these cases they would not be able to subscribe on a monthly basis so what would happen students would not be able to extract the information students would not be able to read elsewhere as well and as a result the cognitive ability the thinking ability the innovative ability of the students will also suffer so if there is allocation that is made to the colleges they would be able to buy these subscriptions on a yearly basis on a monthly basis but since they do not have the money the major problem is that they would be the major sufferers the third major concern is fall in the standards what do we mean by it there is one of the university called as v narmad south gujarat university which had to reschedule exams for the selected bcom and ba courses why because the paper happened to leak as well this is not only restricted to the universities this is also happening at the state level government exams as well there are number of state examinations which are also leaking the paper from the pre-university level from the 10 standards to the arts and science degrees every single university or most of the university have also put themselves in this particular state so what we are witnessing is fall in standards because of the examination paper leaks the fourth concern is in reference to india's universities have historically been bastions of free expression and a hub of nationalism when we speak about indian universities let's say for example we have the central hindu college or the queen mary's college in chennai or we speak about jawaharlal nehru university banaras hindu university delhi university or jamia milia islamia university in all these cases these have been the centers where historically they have supported number of political freedom fighters and this also means that when you are running in a university there will be number of opposition viewpoints as well these opposition viewpoints basically means that there will be conflicting opinions this will ultimately nurture that people to question the whole narrative and ultimately there is scientific rational as well but what is happening right now article 19 speaks about right to free expression it also speaks about people voicing their opinion but this is being cut down where police action is initiated against the students they have been arrested as well they have been put behind bars as well and anyone who questions the narrative is also being called as anti-national in number of cases and this will ultimately mean that students may stop questioning they may stop debating and ultimately it is the students who will be the major sufferers is the fourth major concern finally there are just eight indian universities in the top 500 in the qs world university ranking this means that we are not able to compete at the global level so the author in this particular case goes on to say that to foster critical thinking and problem solving along with social ethical emotional capacities and dispositions what we have to do is revamp the education system so what we have is the talent but this talent will have to be captured it has to be reignited research and development will have to be brought into system and what we have to do is to provide major budget allocation to the Indian higher education system is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says the government in business 
the article here is primarily speaking about role of the government when it comes to the economics. What is the position that the government holds when it comes to controlling the natural resources, when it comes to controlling the key important industries in the country. When we speak about Singapore's Government Investment Corporation, it has invested internationally in equities. The GIC investments account for about 50 lakh crores worldwide. GIC has shares worth 1.09 lakh crores at the end of March 2022 in India alone and GIC is the 8th largest wealth management fund in the world. What is this Government Investment Corporation? This happens to be a government-owned company which is assigned to manage Singapore's sovereign wealth fund. The money that is invested has doubled in the last 20 years and the government uses the amount to fund its public welfare measures. Then we have similar such attempts that is also taken up in China as well. The government in China is also undertaking similar investments. The municipal government of FI had invested $787 million to gain a 17% in your score business and after exiting it made a profit of over five times the investment by 2017 Chinese state firms had invested over 67 lakh crores in foreign companies which is about 27 percent of the Indian GDP so what do we understand we understand that there are some state-owned entities and companies which are working for the government in Singapore and China and they are able to generate profits for the government but in India what are we doing we are selling our assets in India what are we doing we are having this process of disinvestment this the author says should not have been done in India so the trend in India indicates that the government is mainly focused on disinvesting Navaratna PSUs which are performing well are also being sold this should not be done so says the author but the government is justifying this disinvestment by saying that the government has no business to be in business but it is said that the rising government deficit is actually influencing India's disinvestment plans so because the government is running through the government deficit which is why it is selling but unfortunately these are our natural resources these are the industries that we have to run if they are not working efficiently it is good that we sell them but if they are making profits if they are these golden ones which are able to generate profits for us why sell them is the question that is being asked by the author India in the present situation uses a western ideology about government owned companies but forgets that the west preaches it for others but what it practices is the national self-interest the world's list of top asset holding PSUs include the US Israel, European Union countries, but there are none from India. So the author in this particular case says that India has believed in disinvestment. It has believed in selling the national assets, but this should not be the case, says the author. Smaller and loss-making ones need to be disinvested, no doubt about it, but the profitable ones can be reformed and should be reformed, says the author. So what are the measures that we have to take? So when it comes to the measures that we have to take, what is that we have to do? As of now, there is a lot of political interference when it comes to these government agencies as well as the government industries in such case the interference of the political system should be completely removed what is happening in the private sector in india when it comes to the private sector we have a lot of talent where do the talent come they have to be paid so even in the government if there are industries if there are navaratna companies which is giving us profit this should not be interfered by the political parties as well as their masters but instead we have to acquire the talent Pay them as much as the industrial standards is and they should be allowed to reinvent this entire process. So once they reinvent, this will come into the profit making and such profit making initiatives will allow us to expand on the global horizons as well. If you consider China, it uses its public sector units and it is influencing the public sector units to control some other unit in some other country. India should also capture the public sector unit sentiment, make sure that it comes up to the profit level and should make use of these Navaratna companies to influence some other country world over. For example, we have the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. For example, we have the BEL as well. These are some 
some of the core industries. These core industries will have to influence some other countries' companies is what is the author trying to promote. Added to it, if we can take certain lessons from Singapore and China, the same will have to be drawn, implemented into India, adopted to India so that we can also devise a plan so that we are able to generate the profits is what is this article all about. So the author goes on to say, back in the 1980s, we had the telecom sector, which was revamped. Why? Because there were private options that were available to the government. Then we also have the Aadhaar scheme as well. This Aadhaar scheme also has the participation of the private sector. So if need be, bring in the private sector, revamp this entire process, make sure that the loss making or in fact, the one which are in the profit levels is further increasing the profit levels. So the government industries which are working good, which are running fine, which are in the profit mode, same should be continued and should not be sold is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the main practice questions. The crackdown on the illegal use of loudspeakers in religious places in many states is the right step in the right direction as the use of loudspeakers is not a fundamental right and no religion or sect should claim that right to use loudspeakers. Explain the statement with the help of relevant case laws. Departure from the substantive and procedural justice need deep scrutiny as the follow could severely imperil the governance. Analyze. So please write all your answers on the comment section peer review do give positive feedback to your friends answers as well so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best